welcome everybody to our next video on deep learning. So today we want to talk about again feed forward networks fourth part and the main focus today will be layer abstraction. Of course we talked about those neurons and individual nodes but this uh, grows really complex for larger networks so uh, we want to introduce this layer concept also in our computation of the gradients. So uh, yeah, we this is really useful because we can then talk directly about gradients on entire layers and don't need to go towards all of the different nodes. So how do we express this? And uh, let's recall what our single neuron is doing. The single neuron is computing essentially an inner product of its weights and by the way we are expanding now we are skipping over this bias notation so we are expanding this vector by one additional element the x vector by one additional element that is one and this allows us to describe the bias also in the inner product that is shown on this slide here so let's magnify this a bit that you can read the formulas better and this is really nice because then you can see that the output prediction y hat is just an inner product. Now let's think about the case that we have m neurons, which means that we get some y hat of m and all of them are inner products. So if you bring this into a vector notation... The vector space representation summing up uh, the input from all sensors. Th that does, does not show any pictures, but it shows... Uh, you can see that the vector y hat is nothing else than a matrix multiplication of x um, with this matrix w. And you see that a fully connected layer is nothing else than a matrix multiplication. Of course, we are building on all these um, great abstractions that people have invented over the millennia, such as matrix multiplications. So we can essentially represent arbitrary connections and topologies using this uh, in the fully connected layer. And then we also apply a pointwise nonlinearity such that we really get this nonlinear effect here. Uh, now the nice thing about the matrix notation is of course that we can describe now the uh, entire layer derivative using uh, matrix calculus. So our fully connected layer would then get the following configuration. Let's consider three elements of the input. Uh, then they have for every neuron, uh, let's say we have two neurons. Then we get a weight vector, we multiply the two, and in the forward pass, we simply have determined this y hat. For this module, if we want to compute the uh, gradients, then we need exactly two gradients, and it's, it's the same gradients as we already mentioned. We need the gradient with respect to the weights. That's going to be partial derivative with respect to w and the partial derivative with respect to x for the back propagation to pass it on to the next module. So how does this evolve? Well, we have the layer that is y hat equals to wx. So there's a matrix multiplication and a forward pass. Then the gradient with respect to the weights. And now you can see that what we essentially need to do is uh, we need uh, a matrix derivative here and the derivative of y hat with respect to w is going to be simply x transpose. So if we have the uh, loss that comes in into our module, the update to our weights is going to be this loss vector multiplied x transpose. So we have some loss vector and x transpose, which essentially means that you have two different uh, directions. Yeah? One is, is a column vector and the other one is a row vector. So if you multiply the two, you will end up with a matrix. So the above partial derivative with respect to w will always result in a matrix. And then if you look at the bottom row, you need the partial derivative of y hat with respect to x, also something you can find in the matrix cookbook. By the way, I put the link into the description of this video. Matrix cookbook is very, very useful. You find all kinds of matrix derivatives in this one. 
So if you do that, uh, then you can see for above equation, the partial with respect to x uh, is going to be w transpose. And now you have w transpose multiplied again by some loss vector. And this loss vector times a matrix is going to be a vector again. And this is the vector that you will pass on in the backpropagation process towards the next higher layer. OK, so let's look into some example. We have some simple example first, and then a layer example next. So the simple example is going to be the same network as we had it already. So this was network without any nonlinearity, wx. And now we need some loss function. Here we don't take cross entropy, but we take the L2 loss, which is a, a common vector norm. And what it does is we simply take the output of the network, subtract uh, the desired output, and then compute the L2 loss, which means that we element-wise square the different vector values and sum all of them up. And then in the end, you would take a square root, but we want to omit the square root, so we take the L2 to the power of 2. And because we want to have uh, this, when we compute the, uh, the derivatives of this L2 norm to the power of 2, of course, we will have a factor 2 sh uh, showing up, and this will be cancelled out by this uh, factor 1 over 2 in the beginning of the loss. By the way, this is a regression loss. This also has uh, statistical relations. So we will talk about this when we talk about uh, loss functions in more detail. So L2 loss. The nice thing is for L2 loss, there's also very neat matrix derivatives that you also find in the matrix cookbook. And what we do now is we compute the partial derivative of L with, with respect to y hat. And this will give us then wx minus y. And then we can continue and compute the update for our weights. So the update of the weights is this what we return from the loss function. So the derivative of the loss function with respect to the input was wx minus y times x transpose. And this will give us the update for the matrix weights. And the other loss that we want to compute is the partial derivative of the loss with respect to x. So this is going to be, as we've seen on the previous slide, w transpose times the vector that comes from the loss function. And here this is going to be uh, wx minus y, as we determined in the third row uh, of this slide. OK, so let's add some layers and change our estimator into free functions, free nested functions. Here we have some linear matrices. So this is an academic example. You could see that by multiplying w1, w2, and w3 with each other, then they would simply collapse into a single matrix. Still, I find this example useful because it shows you what actually happens in the computation of the backpropagation process and why those specific steps are really useful. So again, we take the L2 loss function. And here we have our three matrices inside. And next, we have to go ahead and compute gradients. Now, the gradients here, let's start with the layer 3. So the most outer layer is actually where we have to start. And let's look into the partial derivative with respect to W3. So you see that we now compute the partial derivative of the loss function with w3, first time chain rule, then means that we have to compute the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to f3, and the partial derivative of f3 with respect to w3. So if we do so, the partial derivative of the loss function, again, is simply the inner part of the loss function. So this is w3, w2, w1, x minus y. And the partial derivative of the net is going to be uh, w2, w1, x transpose, as we've seen on the previous slides. Uh, note that I'm indicating the affinity of the matrix operator. Yeah? So in, ma in matrices, it makes a difference whether you compute them from the left and from the right. Yeah? The two multiplication directions are different. So, so I'm just 
indicating that you have to compute this from the right hand side. Now let's do that and we end up with the final update for W3 that is simply computed from those two expressions. Now the partial derivative with respect to W2 is a bit more complicated because we have to apply the chain rule twice. So again we have to compute the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to F3 but then we need the partial derivative of F3 with respect to W2 which means we have to apply the chain rule again so we have to expand compute the partial derivative of F3 with respect to F2 and then the partial derivative of F2 with respect to W2. This doesn't change, it's exactly the same term as we used before. Now if we compute the partial derivative of F3 with respect to F2, remember F2 is W2 W1x, it's going to be W3 transposed and we have to multiply it from the left hand side. Then we go ahead and compute the partial derivative of F2, which is going to be W2, W1x. So with respect to W2, you remain with W1x transpose. So the final matrix derivative is going to be the following expression. We can repeat this for the last layer, but now we have to apply the chain rule. We have to apply the chain rule again. And we see there's already two parts that we pre-computed, but we have to apply it again. So here we then get the partial derivative of f2 with respect to f1 and the partial derivative of f1 with respect to w1, which then yields us uh, w3 w1x minus y, which is something we used before. We already know this one from the last computation. Now we need to compute this anew. Remember f2 is simply w2 w1x. So the partial derivative with respect to f1, which is w1x, it's going to be w2. And then we still have to compute the partial derivative of f1, which is w1x. So the partial derivative with respect to w1 is going to be x transpose. So we end up with this expression for the gradient. Now you can see if we do the backpropagation algorithm, we end up in a very similar way of processing. So first we compute the forward pass through our entire network, evaluate the loss function, and then we can look at the different gradients and depending where I want to go, I have to compute the respect partials. For the update of the last layer, I have to compute the partial derivative of the loss function and multiply it with the partial derivative of the last layer with respect to the weights. Now if I go to the second last layer, I have to compute the partial derivative with respect to the loss function, the partial derivative of the last layer with respect to the inputs, and the partial derivative of the second last layer with respect to the weights to get the update. And if I want to go to the first layer here, I have to compute all the respective backpropagating steps for the entire layers until I end up with the respective update on the very first layer. And you can see that we can pre-compute a lot of those values and reuse them, which allows us to implement backpropagation very efficiently. We are happy that it works better than any competing method. Okay, let's summarize what we've seen so far. So we've seen that we can combine the softmax activation function with the cross entropy loss, and then we can very naturally work with multi-class problems. We use gradient descent as a def default choice algorithm for deep learning and we can achieve local minima using this strategy. Uh, we can of course compute gradients only numerically by finite differences and this is very useful for checking your implementations. This is something you will definitely need in the exercises. And then we use the backpropagation algorithm to compute the gradients very efficiently in order to be able to update the weights. So the fully connected layer, what we've seen, uh, can be abstracted as a complete layer and we can also compute layer-wise gradients. So it's not required to compute everything on a node level, but you can really go into layer abstraction and you see that their matrix calculus turns out to be very useful. Such as matrix multiplications. Okay, what happens next time in deep learning?
Well, we will see that right now we have uh, only a limited number of loss functions. So we'll see problem adapted loss functions for regression and classification. We see that there, the very simple optimization that we talked about right now with choosing eta is probably not the right way to go. So there's much better optimization programs. They can be adapted to the needs of every single parameter. And uh, then we'll also see an argument why neural networks shouldn't perform that well and some recent insights why they actually do perform quite well. I also have a couple of comprehensive questions. So you should definitely be able to name different loss functions for multicast classification. So one hot encoding is something everybody needs to know. If you want to take the oral exam with me, you will have to be able to describe this. And then of course, uh, something I probably won't ask in the exam, but something that will be very useful for your uh, daily routine is that you work with finite differences and use them for implementation checks. You have to be able to describe the backpropagation algorithm. And uh, to be honest, I think this, although it's academic, but this multi-layer uh, way, abstraction way of describing backpropagation algorithm is really useful. And it's also very nice if you want to explain backpropagation in an exam situation. What else? Uh, you have to be able to describe the problem with exploding and vanishing gradients. What happens if you choose your either too high, too low? What's a loss curve and how does it change over the iterations? Take a look at those graphs. Um, they are really relevant and they also help you understand what's going wrong in your training process. So you need to be aware of those. And also uh, it should be clear to you by now why the sine function is a bad choice for an activation function. We have some links to further reading that I will also post in the description of this video. And of course, we have plenty of references. So you can see the references here. Today, it's not that much. Uh, but again, I recommend to pause the video to have a look at the references or to look in the description of this video. So I hope you still had fun with those videos. And please continue watching and see you in the next video. Thank you very much.